Now here's your host for Forum 50, Television 50's Community Relations Director, Linda Johnson. Good afternoon and welcome to Forum 50. Today we're going to be dealing with an idea. The idea is technocracy. It had its inception in 1919 in New York City when an industrial engineer, Howard Scott, drew together a group of scientists, engineers, and economists who later became known as the Technical Alliance of North America. This Technical Alliance researched and studied how to apply the achievements of science to social and industrial affairs with the aim of providing a better standard of living in continental North America with the least possible waste of non-renewable resources. The Alliance incorporated in 1933 as a nonprofit, nonpolitical, nonsectarian membership organization. Today there are units and members of technocracy in most states and in most provinces in Canada. It is supported entirely by dues and donation of the members. And today I have with me Mr. Rio McCaslin, who's the Director of Technocracy Incorporated, located, he's located in San Francisco, and Mr. John Taubey of Ronald Park. Technocracy, by its very name, is frightening to a lot of people because uh, I think a lot of people today feel that some of the problems we're having, rightly or wrongly, is, is because we don't understand technocracy and we feel like... Um, the technical aspect has maybe come, has gotten out of control, whether through pollution or use of uh, technology and doing away with jobs for people. And just describe why technocracy would be good for us, if you can. Well, I'm going to start it off by asking a question. Uh, <laughs> then I'll answer your question. Okay. <laughs> what has happened to our economy? Here, the United States, one of the greatest nations in the world, or the greatest nation in the world, finds itself in trouble and uh, having difficulty solving the problems that are confronting them, confronting us. Uh, Technoxy was born out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, several men after World War I uh, decided that they would look into what technology was doing as far as our social structure was concerned. Uh, they had noted that Many thousands of the boys were taken out of the industrial processes, sent to war, but at the same time we were able to produce not only for the war, but for ourselves without them. And they wondered how far this would go. And that's how it got started. And now the question is, uh, uh, why are we facing a problem? Uh, Technocracy has asked that, and people have asked us why we are facing a problem. And the reason why we're facing a problem is because we have not adjusted to the change that technology has brought as far as our economic uh, and social order is concerned. For the first time in the history of man, uh, the citizens of the North American continent find themselves in a position where they can produce just about as much of anything that they care to due to technology. And, but somehow it has created a problem. Now, when the Great Depression hit us in 1930, it was a result that we had reached that point where we had too much of everything for the system to handle. I was in the milk business at that time, and I can remember we sold milk for five cents a quart. Peas from the farm were five and two cents a pound. Nobody was making money. Then Roosevelt stepped in, and lo and behold, how did he solve the problem? By destroying the farm products, pouring milk down in the sewer, shooting the hogs and cattle mm -hmm. to get back to a sufficient scarcity uh, so that we could start to rebuild again. Now, our process has become so adequate as far as our ability to produce that it doesn't take long for us to catch up and once again get in the same situation of having too much. Okay, now, so what, what technocracy is saying, then, uh, we're not are you going to affect the change in production, or what are you going to affect it? What, what would technocracy change for us today? It, it, you know, if, if the principles of technocracy could be applied to the northern continent now, how would we be affected? Would you change uh, the way we distribute? Would you change our social order? Would you change uh, the price and money system? How, what would you do? Well, we would change. We certainly would have to change the system. There's no question about that. Because the rules of the game as it is played today are, were valid 150 years ago. Uh, but since the advent of technology, they're not valid today. Uh, that's why we're having our trouble. We, we take money, for instance, uh, and when we mention money, of course, that hits everybody. Yeah. But money actually is not fulfilling its role. 
In other words, we have the technicians, we have the engineers, we have what uh, we know what we have to do and want to do, but it's always a question of who's going to pay and can we raise the money. And right now, of course, we're going to cut down in our, 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 in our national program, we're going to cut down on uh, the amount of money that's going to be allotted to uh, the people that are poor, uh, the people that are sick, the people that need that, but it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. We say we've got to balance the budget. Uh, but we have all of the material things that we actually need. It's finding a way to organize our technology for the benefit of people. Okay, we are going to have to stop for a pause, but when we get back, we, I would like to talk to you a little bit more about organizing because uh, that seems to be where every system has broken down. There's been a lot of systems pr uh, proposed over the years, and I don't know if you'd like to be loved in, but there's been socialism and communism and groups that say, let's start over and, and change the base that we're talking about, whether incentives to people or whatever, but they all seem to eventually have to revert back to uh, compensating people. There, there seems to be a level that people... You can all start out on one level, but there's always some that, that move up and some that move down, and there has to be some sort of compensation. It seems like the, the human animal loves compensation of some sort, and that seems to be where the money aspect comes in. Well, money has represented to him, uh, to man, of course, the ability to get the things that he needed in order to live. Right. And naturally, it's a great concern to him that he gets his allotted share or as much as yeah. he can out of the thing. But where you, have, uh, where you have reached the point where you can produce a high standard of living for everyone, why money doesn't enter into the picture. Now, let's, let's check back just a little bit. In the old days, back thousand, a few thousand years, we used to exchange things on a barter system. Then when manufacturing picked up and there were more goods available, bartering system became cumbersome and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So somebody introduced money. Now money has taken, has been very efficient up until the present time. But our, once again, our manufacturing and our uh, ability to produce has risen to the extent where money now is getting in the way. Just the same as the barter system did. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to uh, it measures the goods and produce them and distribute them. We have to have an accounting system based upon the energy that it took to produce them. Okay, That's now the on that note, cost. okay, <laughs> on that note, we're going to yeah. come back and we're going to talk about energy certificates because that's what you propose, right? Welcome back to discussion of technocracy. And Neil, before we left, we were talking at the time about possibly money uh, pricing has outlived its usefulness in today's society. And technocracy has a, an interesting concept that uh, could go one step beyond, and that would be the idea of energy certificates for individuals. Can you explain a little bit what that would be? Well, energy, of course, is the basis of all movement that takes place in a physical world. It, it, nothing would move, there would be no activity whatsoever if it wasn't for the energy. We ourselves are energy consuming devices. We take on food and as a result we have energy. If we stop eating, we soon lose our energy. Our energy being basic then, the actual physical cost of the pr production of goods is the amount of energy that it takes to produce it from the raw material uh, to the used form. And so technocracy suggests that we set up what we call a functional type of social operation. A functional type. Now, you have it today, uh, but it isn't paramount. It, 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 we're not quite aware of it. I, I can give you an example. The telephone company is a functional operation. You pick up your phone, you dial a certain number, and you get results. Now, we may not know how it works or just what takes place, but it does work. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And it works because the right people are on the job. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. And so I, we talk about a functional government. There's about, uh, say, arbitrarily, around 70 functions that are necessary for a high-energy civilization such as we have. I'll name a few to give you an idea of what I mean. It's education, communication, uh, transportation, and so on down the line. These functional capacities. Now, from within each one of those functions, those that are in the function itself will select somebody to represent them at the top. So that you'll have about 70 men or women at the top of a control board because of their functional capabilities only. Not because they're good politicians or anything at all, it's because they are functionally capable. They've been selected by their own kind. Now they'll select somebody to act as chairman of the board or director of, of, of the uh, 
uh, of the group. So no matter what problem comes up in the functional aspect, there's somebody there that has the answer, that knows what to do about it, because they're all tops in their particular profession. So in essence, are you saying uh, let's do away with a, with a certain level of management, the, the middle class management? Or, or, because right now, you know, when you talk about the phone company, okay, beyond the people who keep the phones running, the repairmen and the, and the women who don everything, there is a level of management up there, the, the supervisors. Superstructure. The super, all right, are you saying that in uh, the energy certificates and technology, there would be no need for that upper well, level? Well, you see, now you're talking about the superstructure. That's the financial end of it, mm -hmm. you see. Yeah. Now, when you, whenever you weigh anything as to what you can do without and what you have to have, Mm -hmm. uh, you simply eliminate in your mind one or the other to see what happens. Now, if you eliminate the financial structure and you keep the technicians on the job. Uh, let me give you an illustration about that. Now, uh, Mrs. McCaslin and myself, when we go on these trips and tours to talk, uh, we often fly. Now, when we mm -hmm. buy our ticket, we don't ask who the co-pilot is or who the pilot is. We don't care. It's a functional thing, and we know that whoever is at the, uh, the struggle of that particular airplane knows what they're doing, otherwise they wouldn't be there. Would you have felt that way in that Air Florida plane recently when those two men made the decision yeah, to take off? That, that was an accident. That was an accident. <laughs> Something happened there. All right. But I suppose when the passengers gathered together to elect somebody to fly that plane. Would you get on it? No. No. <laughs> Good point. We'll be back in a moment. I find this a fascinating conversation because I'm sure it, it's one that brings out what you are two gentlemen who are sitting here and you really feel self-assured with technology and I'm probably one of the generation that uh, is not that sure about technology so I, I you know I poses all these questions in my mind is I'm not sure I trust equipment or machines I, I still feel like I'm gonna trust human beings a little bit more uh, well just just check yourself for a minute and see how often every single day you rely on technology. Yeah. Think about this morning when you got up, how cold it was outside. And think how you just turned that thermostat and you got warm. Mm -hmm. Think about how much wood you had to chop. Yeah. And then, then when you, when you, when you, uh, your stove, when you turned it on, more wood. And then you use the toaster, or the hair dryer, all of your telephone. You rely so much on technology, people don't realize that. It is kind of a whipping boy, though. Well, they, they made it a whipping boy, but it's the greatest thing that has ever happened to mankind. Mm -hmm. It can take him out of that condition of servitude. It can take him out of the condition of poverty for the first time in human history. But it has to be organized for that purpose. Right. Now, you asked the question about an energy certificate. Uh, the energy certificate is to will take the place of money. It looks something like a traveler's check. It's identifiable to the individual only. And it has, instead of dollars, it has energy units, the number of energy units available so that when you pick up something, you, they would deduct the amount of energy that it took to produce that from the raw materials of the used form. Now, how will people get their energy certificates? Not like they do today, working. Mm -hmm. They'll get it because of their citizenship. Because they're doing so little and they'll do less. I just picked, read an article the other day about, I believe it was the automobile industry. We're talking about in order to compete with Japan, they're going to have to put in more robots. Mm -hmm. But they said when they do put in more robots, they'll only need a fraction of the workers that they have at the present time. And that always leads to then what happens to these, you know, what's going to happen in the transition period between what we know of as, as using the phrase as jobs and workers and that phrase that will no longer be applicable in uh, technocracy. What happens to these people now? And I've always heard, you know, and I've been here for the last 20 years hearing that we're going to have more leisure time and more time to do the things we have. Sure. But that doesn't, you know, now we see people that are retired saying they want to get back and work. Uh, they want to do yes. things. They don't want to be put aside <laughs> somewhere. Well, you and you know, and your technology, you're talking about at 45, you're over the hill and out of the game. You know why? Why? Because they've never learned how to live. All they did was to prepare to make a living. And when they're taken out of it, they don't know anything else. That's why they want to go back. Well, this but there are latent possibilities and potentialities in all of us that have never been developed. 
And when you have the time to develop them, oh, it'll be a new change, a change of mm -hmm. life altogether. But it's the only way out because what we have now at the present time is disintegrating. And we're going to have to go in some direction, and that's the only way we can go. Because we find in the study of nature that everything is unidirectional and irreversible. You've got to go ahead. You can't go back. Mm -hmm. Now we're trying to go back. Mm -hmm. good old. And now you can start a oak tree out of an acorn, but you can't get the oak tree to go back into the acorn. <laughs> that's, that's very true. Yeah. Now, technocracy, as, as of right now, is talking about mainly the continental part of the United of, of North America. You're not even talking about a worldwide situation. Uh, how, or I'd say, uh, Canada and the United States uh, become more of a technocracy? Uh, how does that interplay? Because today we're, we're hearing how dependent we are for oil on the Mideast sure. and places like How will we uh, work our energy certificates and, and people that are still living in the situation of prices? And, and Let me pick, how will that interact? Let me pick up that oil, just the oil and energy. Okay. We had, a, we had a flood recently. The bridge was closed. Mm -hmm. There is no exact figure of the amount of people who couldn't get to work. Now these people, these people who couldn't get to work went into the thousands, but no production was lost because all these people, the majority of people, are in what we call money transfer and paper shuffling. They're not in producing anything. So if, if you get this picture and the amount of people who are engaged in this and merely have them stay home, you're not dependent upon energy no more from the Mideast. And this is the design of technocracy as efficient. Now, let me yeah. bring in one point. Sure. The uh, Ronald Park, the city manager, about a year ago stated that one third of the, of the uh, uh, people in Ronald Park go down to Marin County to work. Mm -hmm. Well, figure that out. They go about Oh, round trip, oh, about 70, 80 miles a day. Now, this is not a pleasure trip. Mm -mm. It's not a pleasure trip. It's just a question of poor organization. Look at all that energy that they're burning, mm -hmm. you see? And not enjoying themselves. And so with the design of technocracy is to see that these things don't occur. And then you could solve your energy problem. People are fiercely independent. I, I would think... What you're talking about, and one question comes to my mind, is, is what about energy certificates for the people that, that are paper shufflers? How do they get their energy certificate? I mean, we're still going to have, a, I assume, a, uh, the same population. The population is not going to keep growing because of technocracy. We've already got a large population, and already a lot of them are pursuing individuals that are not productive in society. Sure. So uh, how, how does the tech technocracy society provide for those individuals that, that are not producing and are not burning energy? It provides for everyone regardless of what their status is. In other words, if there's no jobs for them, why should they suffer? You see, and that's what you have today. The minute one is, uh, is uh, uh, out of work or unemployed, uh, he's put in a position where he is faced with suffering, mm -hmm. lack of ability to do things and so forth because he has lost his employment. But it wasn't his fault, you see. Uh, we've got to think in this way. Instead of a competitive system, one of cooperation, all working together for the same end product, the same desires that all of us have, the production of a high standard of living for everyone. That's all of our desires. And for the first time, you'll think of it differently. Now, we don't think of anything about the air we breathe because it's abundant. There's a lot of it. But believe me, if it was in short supply, it would be the main topic of conversation. Right. You see? Right. Now, when these things become available, they'll take their place just like air does. You don't think of them anymore, unless they get polluted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you are not think of it anymore. And it'll straighten out. But uh, that may be desirable. But the point that I want to put over is this, that your present system is disintegrating, and it's going to get worse. And it's going to reach a point where something will have to take its place if we're going to survive. Now, we technocrats have no ax to grind. Mm -hmm. We're offering this program. Is an informational yeah. option. Right. Okay. Well, on that cheerful note about <laughs> this integration, we're going to take another break, and then we're going to be back. And when we do, we're going to give you a place where you can talk to these individuals more. Thank you for being with us on Forum 50 today, and we've been visiting about 
I think a fascinating subject, technocracy, because whether I understand it or not, technology is here, and it's provided us with probably one of the best standards of living anywhere. And some of us have been kicking, drawn, kicking and screaming into the idea. But these two gentlemen have been with an organization that has been saying since 1919 it's the wave of the future. And I would like now, we do have uh, an address and a phone number if you are interested that you can contact uh, Mr. Rio McCaslin uh, in San Francisco, or you can call Mr. Uh, John Taubey and Ronald Park, and he's 707-795-8442 uh, in Ronald Park, and it's 3243 Balboa Street, San Francisco. And if you really want an interesting conversation and throw up options, uh, believe me, all the ones you can throw up, they've got answers for. <laughs> well, if, if, if those that are interested will get in touch with us, we'll send them the printed material mm -hmm. on the subject that will give them much better understanding than we could possibly do in the short time we have here. Now just and very quickly because we do that, we're not talking about an overthrow, you're not talking about oh. political thing. What you're saying is it's going to have to come to the people and they're going to have to say themselves, you know, that that we tried other options and it's going to have to be this one. Is that what you're Something saying? Something new is going to have to come forward. May I add one other thought though, Linda, sure. with the address? That we do have speakers available for engagements to give talks in any university service clubs or any organization and uh, there's no fee involved and if they either call the phone number that you gave or they'll write to the address why uh, uh, that we can make arrangements for the for the speaker. And so I think it's very interesting. I, I think it's a fascinating concept and I, I think it's certainly as viable as anything that uh, has been put out politically in the last few years so I, I just 